but here goes. Uh, Slavs dissonance is basically about the problem that we have in uh, academia among those who doubt Darwin. We call them Darwin doubters. And I use that term because it's not just creationists that are Darwin doubters. There's a lot of other people that doubt Darwin. Even atheists who doubt Darwin can get into big trouble. And so it's a, a problem today which, if you were here if you saw my Nazi talk, several people asked me why I got so interested in the Nazis. Well, I see amazing parallels. In fact, in my next book I have a whole chapter on the parallels between how the Nazis treated Jews and how creationists are taught. Even the name calling is very similar. They're both called swine, or schwein, I guess, in German. And so uh, they, there's so many similarities. Of course, obviously, there's no you know, camp set up, at least not that I know of, uh, to deal with creationists, but this is a kiss of death for a career. And as if you were at my talk, it's clear the evidence is unequivocal that evolution is going the wrong way. Why would people be, why would they lose their careers, their jobs? And I, the whole series, in fact, this book here is, which just, by the way, the second edition just came out, and I have uh, about 50 cases in here, and this is volume one, you'll notice, and we have so far five volumes planned. There are hundreds of cases out there, and these are cases I've just been able to document carefully by court records, by affidavits, by interviews, etc. So it's a big problem, and... When I present this talk, uh, people usually answer, well, we know why they're suppressing us, because they know full well if we have a chance to present the case to students, who's going to win? Who's going to be convinced of evolution? If they see both sides, I would say 95% or at least of the students would be convinced for the creation worldview as opposed to the Darwinian worldview. Okay, uh, that's the book. That's the old edition, actually. And uh, by the way, I only got three copies left. So, if you want a copy, uh, you have to fight over the last three. And a few scriptures: the beginning, the Creator made the first humans, male and female. You are the salt of the earth. That's us Christians. But if the salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything. Think about that. And in Luke, no man, when he has, a lit, has lit a lamp, puts it in a cellar, nor under a basket, but on a stand, that those who enter may see the light. Think about those scriptures as we go through this presentation. History of the project. Uh, personal experience. I was terminated from Bowling Green State University in Ohio openly due to my increasing disillusionment with Darwinism. Okay, and this was covered by Christianity Today, Conservative Digest, Liberty, and so on. There was a front page article, cover article in Liberty Magazine. So I got a lot of press. From this press, I received many letters and phone calls saying, hey, this happened to me. So I realized that this has happened to many, many, many people. And uh, from then, I began to build... Uh, file cabinets full, and now I have six file cabinets full of documentation on what's going on. I'm not saying the likelihood is zero of surviving in academia. I'm saying it's very, very close to zero. I have found in my 30 years research about, uh, well, three cases of people who have survived. So some people do survive in academia, but by and large, uh, most people do not. All my, my interview of uh, 300 academics and scientists, I found, all face discrimination. So even those who survive face discrimination. It's just they manage to survive in their career. So here's my I say five, five file cabinets here, but I have six now. So uh, what happens? Okay, D primarily denial of tenure is a major problem. Denial of degrees, I was denied a doctorate in sociology. And uh, ironically, it's not just people in science who have a problem, but it's also people in other fields. A friend of mine who was denied a doctorate in English because he's a Darwin doubter. So there's a widespread antagonism toward those who doubt Darwin. And of course the reason why is because Darwin is, as the previous couple of presenters brought out, Darwinism really is a religion. Well, some people don't like to use the word religion, so I'll use the proper term, which is worldview. Darwinism is a way of seeing the world, and it's all-encompassing. Answers questions like where we came from, where we're going, 
the purpose in life, and the meaning of life, all those things are answered by Darwinism, and they're all answered by Christianity. So we're talking about two worldviews now that compete against each other. They butt heads, so to speak. And the evolutionists have managed to get the courts on their side. In fact, there's been, oh, probably 60 cases that have gone to court. And since the Scopes trial, we always lose. Have not won one single case. None. Always lose. The courts side with the other side. Why? Well, they have the money. They have the expertise. They can get people from Cornell and Harvard and Princeton and University of California, Berkeley, et cetera, to testify, where we have a hard time doing that. Now, we have had some conflicts where we did the creationists testified, and in at least three cases, people who testified in court as a result of testifying, when they got home, they lost their job. Now, that's illegal, but uh, that's, that happens. And I mention these cases in my book. And denial promotion is also a problem. The least problematic are community colleges. The most problematic is state universities that have doctoral programs. And four-year colleges, of course, are in the middle. Medical colleges, I have th three degrees from medical school, and I find that they are uh, less problematic than universities. Okay, in this book here, it's about... Uh, 500 pages and about a thousand footnotes, so it's well documented. And uh, basically, the problem is questioning Orthodox Darwinism can and often does end a promising career. And some of the careers that I documented were very, very promising. People had published in the leading scientific journals, they had cover stories in leading scientific magazines, and their career was ended as a result of this issue. Gonzalez is one who, uh, his book is back there in the book table, although he doesn't talk about this. But This was documented in the film Expelled, which uh, most of the cases in the film were documented in my book. And uh, the other side, they have this website called Expelled Exposed, which turns out to be, <laughs> I hate to say a farce, but irresponsible. It just basically they looked at the, you know, came up with reasons that are just not true. Uh, by and large, I think the reason they did that, besides of course they wanted to expose the film, but by and large they did that because they're simply not aware of the other side. They haven't really looked at the other side and so they gave reasons that were superficial and in most cases absolutely wrong. Okay, my conclusion from my research, it's unlikely that an outer closet Darwin doubter, now that that's important to stress because there's a lot of Darwin doubters out there. You know, about every university I go and speak to, I find one or two or three comes up after me and says, oh yeah, I'm a, I don't go along with Darwinism. Well, how's things going here? Well, uh, no problem. Uh, what do you teach? Oh, I teach biology. And well, how, how have you survived? Well, nobody knows really what I believe. Now, nobody's come up and said, are you a creationist? Are you, do you doubt Darwin? Nobody's asked me that. They don't care, I guess. They're busy doing their own thing. So as long as you stay in, your, in the closet, you're okay. And because of what's happened, as documented in the film, expelled in my book, there are many, many now PA students and professors who I meet often who are in the closet and going to stay there until they have security or they may stay there for the rest of their lives. Okay, so there's a lot of doctoral students right now who I know personally who realize Darwinism is wrong, clearly wrong. It never occurred as we as I brought out in my presentation. But they're in the closets, and they're just going to do their research and write their books and, and survive and stay in the closet. And so that's how, that's how you survive. And the problem is, when I did this PowerPoint, the problem is primarily in academia, few problems in government, military, industry, or business, but now I'm finding more and more problems in government, military, and industry, and business. Somebody from here just mention the problems now that they're encountering in the military, that they're becoming militantly, militantly against Christianity and especially creationism. So the, the problems are spreading. The problem is what I call fanatical Darwin fundamentalists. And by the way, that expression is not mine. That is by Stephen Jay Gould. He calls people who are, well, fanatical 
Darwinists, he calls them fundamentals. So I'm not sure if that word fits, but... Or you might want to call them true believers. And by and large, and I've tried to dialogue with these people, and I love to talk about this issue, which should be pretty obvious by now, but I love to talk about it, and it's so difficult to talk about this to Darwinists. They just... One of the main things that happens is you get a barrage of pornography and, and salacious comments. And that's just you know, verbal pornography. And that's just not what I expect from academics. I guess I had the impression, as probably a lot of college students do, that professors are smart and cool and calm and intellectual and nerds and spend a lot of time reading books. And, and, uh, but I worked in a prison and interacting with colleagues in universities, I found that the colleagues can really outdo the prisoners, the criminals, for salacious language. <laughs> and I never, and I have to admit, I learned a few words. <laughs> I guess I'm not up on swear words, so I, but that is surprising because I would think they would want to dialogue, that they would want to discuss this. I had one colleague who actually got along pretty well. I worked with his wife, and he taught at a Christian college. And uh, he, I wasn't able to dialogue with him, but he did email me once and said, you know, Dr. Bergman, you're an intelligent guy. You've written a lot of books. You have a lot of degrees. How could you believe this stuff? How could you believe in creationism? And I wrote back, and I said, well, it's the evidence is very clear. And I gave him some examples, and that's the last I heard. Never heard anything else from him. He taught at Christian college. So I thought at least that he would be willing to dialogue about it, but he wasn't. He has a, he's a herpetologist. He has his doctorate in herpetology, and I wrote an article on the evidence for snake evolution. Of course, there is no evidence. And the literature is very, very clear that snakes appear out of nowhere. There's some hypotheses as to where they, how they evolved, but the most common is, is they were uh, four-footed animals, you know, tetrapods that lost their feet. That's the most common explanation, but of course there's no evidence for that, but that's the, the explanation. But that seems to be downward evolution and not uh, a mature evolution. Okay, uh, con there's less problem in industry because most companies are really not worried about whether you believe this or that. They're worried about whether or not you can make the company money. I guess there's one advantage of being very money-oriented. That's what you worry about. And if I'm making the company money, they don't care if I believe the earth is flat or square. They don't care. If I'm making the company money, they're happy. And that's the concern. So in, in essence, in industry, by and large, there's far less concern. In academia, they're very concerned about what you believe. Very, very concerned, especially politically and religiously. There's a lot of concern. And a good example is there's been many, many surveys which show that conservatives, Republicans especially, are pretty much not welcome at universities. And they've done surveys of how many faculty are conservative, how many faculty are Republicans, and how many faculty are Democrats. Consistently, about 90% of faculty are liberal, Democrats, socialist, or communists. Okay? Then recently a study, which I haven't looked up yet, but it was mentioned on Bill O'Reilly a couple days ago, that someone did a study of speakers at the top universities, and they found like 85% were liberals. And I don't mean to use that in a derogatory term, but I'll try to define that. Liberals are, well, my concern with liberals is they're not very liberal. And they're not very tolerant. And, and many, I, I don't mean to overgeneralize, I have a lot of good friends that are liberals, but it's, uh, unfortunately, so many are just not very, very tolerant. So in academia, what you believe is very, very important. In my own case, I went to court and dealt with this, tried to deal with it. The NEA sponsored it because the university did not follow their own rules. And the NEA said, if they fire someone, they've got to follow their own rules. They've got to give you a hearing. They've got to give you feedback. I was there seven years, never had one single written evaluation during seven years. Nothing. Okay? And they're required every year to give me a written evaluation on my performance. That's required. It's required by the university. And the NEA said, well, they didn't follow their own rules, so therefore we have a good case. Well, we went to court, and of course it didn't turn out that way. But uh, when I went to court, the, the arguments actually my colleagues used, they were pretty open. They were by and large pretty honest. 
And they said things like, we are afraid that he might have proselytized students to his worldview. We had no evidence, we didn't know, but we feel fear of that is such a, a major problem that that is justifiable reason to terminate somebody. So being suspected of proselytizing students toward Maya, and they, they admitted they weren't sure what religion I was. Okay, they say, one person said, well, he came all over the place. So we really weren't sure what he was, but they were sure that I wasn't in their camp, and therefore they felt that was justifiable reason to terminate me, which the court approved. The court said, yeah, you're, you, know, you can't dare read the Bible, and of course they weren't accusing me of that, but uh, that's really be terrible, you know, if I read the Bible, but <laughs> you can't. Uh, but they were suspect, sus suspected I might have. But what I did do, which they did bring out, which I actually did was, I gave a list of topics that students could do uh, reports on, and among the list of topics, I put religion and the schools. Now, no one did a report on that, but they said I should not have had that as an optional topic. I should not let students do reports on religion and the schools. And they brought that out in court, and I guess the judge says, yeah, I shouldn't do reports on that. That's not an appropriate topic for a secular university to do a report on. And in all cases, and this is an important point because in all cases, they were not fired for what they did. They were fired for who they are. In all the cases, there was none of the cases did they really do something that was a problem. They were in all the cases fired for who they are or who the, their colleagues felt they are or were in this case. Okay, teaching creationism accusation. That's uh, commonly level, they said, we are teaching creationism. And that, of course, is meaningless because the simple fact is, and I've done surveys on this, is that thousands and thousands of university professors teach creationism. That's not the problem. The problem is what you teach about creation. It's all right to, and they're openly about this, it's all right to teach against it. But you cannot teach for it. So creationism is taught throughout the United States, openly. It's in the textbooks. And many professors write articles about how I teach creationism. But in all these cases, they're teaching against it. So it's fine to teach against it, but it's a problem if they think you're teaching for it. The second thing is, is that, ironically, if you critique Darwinism, if you bring out information which is problematic for Darwinism, that is considered backdoor teaching of creationism, which is ironic. So if you say anything negative about Darwinism or about evolution, that's backdoor teaching of creationism and that's illegal. And again, the courts have gone along with that. That has not been uh, so far. Although there's one case which I think is interesting, which I followed very carefully. John Freshwater was accused of, among other things, teaching creationism, but they found no evidence for that. And uh, he was accused, though, of burning crosses on students' arms. You heard of that case? Even Fox News reported it and said, what an idiot, teaching uh, creationism and uh, burning crosses on students' arms. Well, of course, he said they didn't do it, and the school did. In fact, the court case ruled against Freshwater, and the school had to pay a half million dollars to this child who had a cross burned on his arm. The interesting thing is, is they had 10 people testify in the case. All 10 who were in the classroom said, this never happened. No evidence that it happened. Okay? Court didn't seem to care because, yeah, all those 10 kids are lying. The kid said he had a cross burned on his arm. It must have happened, so therefore they gave the kid about a half million dollars. But that case now is at the Ohio Supreme Court, and quite astounding. The judges in this case, the first case, really saw through all of this, and it's incredibly good testimony as well as incredibly good questions by the judges at the Ohio Supreme Court. So this may be one case, who knows, but this may be one case which we actually may prevail. They showed, for example, that freshwater students knew more about evolution than the other teachers. More about evolution, which you expect because there's been at least three doctoral dissertations done, finding if you teach both creation and evolution, they know more about evolution because we know teaching by contrast is far more effective than teaching one side. If you want to learn about something, it's good to look at the other side that helps you learn 
the first side, the one that you want students to accept. So by teaching both sides, teaching by contrast, they call that, that's a very effective means of uh, teaching students whatever. Okay, now some of these cases actually they let, were let go because, and this is actually part of the court records or the testimony, they were let go because they could not enthusiastically push Darwinism. And they said this. There's one case in Ohio, ironically, of a college uh, professor, and that case is in my book, and they basically the people said, well, they were in his class and there was no evidence he was teaching creationism, and he taught evolution, he taught evolution well, and the kids liked him, and I've got his student ratings, by the way, in all the comments in my book. But he couldn't teach it, and this is what they said, couldn't teach it enthusiastically. So therefore, we let him go. And I called his department chair and talked to him, who was in his classroom two or three times, and he told me right on the phone, and I have this on the, the record, he says, he's a great teacher, the students love him, he's a better teacher than I am, to be honest, but he's not a committed Darwinist, and therefore, he has to go, and of course, he ended up uh, going, lost his career. Uh, slaughter, the title extreme, that's probably the number one complaint I had about the book, and not many people, there have been a couple suicides over this, there have been a couple homicides that I'm aware of, so there hasn't been a lot of cases, but a few, and they said, isn't that kind of extreme slaughter? Well, I don't know, I had come up with a good title, and in many ways, there were slaughtered. They lost their livelihood, their careers, their family, their life savings, their health, and a couple of cases, uh, suicide and uh, murder. So, uh, except murder wasn't in America, it was in another country, which I won't mention, so uh, conflict there. But, and uh, critically, as, as I did, you need to spend some time with these people. And I became, my background is in psychology, so they, I guess I... They must have picked that up, and so I spent so many hours on the phone talking with these people, and I got to know them because of investigating their case, and I've never heard so many grown men cry as I have when I interview people about the cases, just in tears over what happened to their lives. And divorce is not, I ended up divorced because of it, so divorce is not uncommon, unfortunately. And you can understand that because the, the turmoil in going through this can be very upsetting in a marriage, to a marriage. Loss of career is difficult to deal with. The number one reason women commit suicide is why? Why do women commit suicide? Come on, you know. Loss of, pardon? Yeah, husbands. Women commit suicide because of us. <laughs> We're the problem. Boyfriends, husbands, etc. That's why women commit suicide. Okay, we got one case, I think, in Arizona where a woman killed her husband 27 times. She stabbed him and uh, really brutal. And, of course, you know, the problem was he wanted to date somebody else. <laughs> so she couldn't deal with that. So she, what's her name? Uh, I forget. Uh, Arius? Is that, but what's the number one reason men commit suicide? C career. For a man, it's, it's central to a man's identity, his career. And so loss of career uh, can be pretty tragic for a male. And if you think about it, a lot of people, they said to me, well, why don't you get a job as a truck driver? You know, and I said, well, the problem is yeah, I had nine years of school. I, I had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on my education. Fortunately, I got a scholarship, so uh, most of my degrees were paid for thanks to you people, the taxpayers paid them because I got scholarships, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much for <laughs> funding my education, but I, they gave them to me, so I guess they felt they must have deserved him. But we're talking about a young man, typically 20s, 30s, in debt, uh, school loans, could be $100,000 or more, and loss of a career is, for these reasons, difficult to deal with. You have to wonder, what are you going to do next? How do you survive? once you've lost your career. And a lot of these people I worked with, they just never expected. They thought if they had a good record, if their student evaluations were good, if their performance was good, if they were doing well, they can't do anything but give them tenure. And they found out, as I did, the hard way, it doesn't matter how much you perform, it doesn't matter what you do. I was the only one in my department that uh, wrote a textbook. Okay, I, was the only, I was the most published faculty in the department. I had more publications than all my colleagues combined. 
My student evaluations were good. I had high ratings in everything. In fact, I was promoted right before I was fired. <laughs> okay. So it was clear that I did a good job. But in the end, that didn't matter. What mattered is I might have proselytized students, but they weren't sure as what I was proselytizing them about, so they couldn't uh, determine that. And uh, one thing I should mention is, is once you're in academia, it's hard to move into something else. You know, very, very hard. Uh, I have applied for all kinds of jobs, and they would say, what is someone like you with a doctorate degree and all these books and publications, why would you want to work for this company driving a truck? Okay, and that's a good job. I had a friend who had a PhD from uh, University of Toledo in history, and he likewise creationist and couldn't get a job. He, uh, he tried and he couldn't even get in in academia. And uh, he went to truck driving school and flunked out. <laughs> so he says, so I didn't want to try it, but uh, he's a bright guy, PhD in history. And uh, he said, you ever know how hard it is to back up a semi? <laughs> he says, try it. He says, I just tried and tried and tried, and I just, I realized it's not going to be the occupation for me. So it's not easy to change careers. Also, they figure if you uh, go into something else and they hire you, academic position opens up, you'll leave and go back to academia. So that was a concern. When they hire someone, it's said it takes six months to a year before you're worth the company's pay. You know, when you hire, you're not, you can't, most people can't immediately fit in and make the company money. So it takes a while before you have the skills necessary and the knowledge necessary to uh, earn, your, earn your pay. So they don't want to hire someone because you'll lose a lot of money. They'll lose a lot of money training you and, and then you'll leave and that does happen. Okay, my suggestions. Uh, stay in the closet. I hate to say that, but that's just the reality. It is, you might be the first case to win and prevail, I don't know, but stay in the closet uh, if you're a creationist. Uh, what about a Christian school? I found the Christian schools are worse. They're worse. A good example is uh, my book here on Darwin that we talked about earlier. Harvard got a copy, Princeton got a copy, University of California Berkeley got a copy, University of Michigan got a copy, Princeton got two copies, and so no problem. A friend of mine gave a copy to Wheaton, and Wheaton says, we're not going to put this in the library. They refused to put it in. After I left Bowling Green, I was at Spring Arbor University a year and a half, Christian college, and they were in many ways a very strict Christian college. They caught a couple of students drinking uptown, and they were expelled. Okay? But this issue, nope, evolution, that's how we got here. God used evolution. Evolution, as we were evolving, God looked down the earth and said, hey, you know, those monkeys there look kind of neat. I think we'll put, the Holy Spirit will put the soul in them and make them the first man and woman, and there we are. But the main concern they had was is that they want to be accepted in the academic world, and they realized that an open, out-of-the-closet creationist on staff is going to impede their acceptance in the academic world. But as a friend of mine said, you can either be secular school or secular school that's well accepted, or a Christian school, and not be accepted, you can't be both. And you really, you can't be both. And that's been brought out here by several others, so I don't mean to uh, belabor the point, but there are some schools, there's probably 12, Liberty University, Cedarville, Master's College, there are some schools that there's not a problem. But by and large, most what I call putative Christian schools, there is a problem. And I thought after Bowling Green let me go. I thought it shouldn't be difficult to find a job at a Christian school. Well, after a while, I gave up, and I realized I have a better chance at a secular school. And then I applied where I'm at now at Northwest State, and I've been there for 27 years. So that's uh, worked out pretty well. Okay, a few case histories. This is interesting. This is one who actually got his degree, uh, Marcus Ross, got his Ph.D. in paleontology at, uh, I think, Rhode, Rhode Island University, I forget where, but this made the front page of the New York Times. Now look, to make the front page of the New York Times, we're talking about world-shattering news. It's not just anything that makes the front page of the New York Times. Okay, that's unusual. 
he made not only the front page when I presented this, he said, Bergman, not just the front page, but the top half, <laughs> which is even better, of the New York Times. That shows you how exceptional, I guess, it is that a creation would actually get his PhD in paleontology from a secular school. Create a storm of protest. There were hundreds of letters, et cetera, demanding his being terminated or his degree being rescinded. He ended up at Liberty Baptist, which is Liberty University now. So uh, he's doing okay. But uh, his professors at uh, the university where he got his degree from, basically, I heard they got irritated. People calling him up and saying, you got to terminate this guy. He's our student. We evaluated him. We made the decision. He earned the PhD. He got the PhD. And we're upset with you people trying to tell us what we should do with our student. Same thing happened by with Kurt Wise at Harvard. Uh, when uh, Kurt told me this, that when he was sitting there with uh, Stephen Jay Gould, that uh, he got a phone call demanding that he not give Kurt Wise a PhD in paleontology from Harvard, because he's not of the closet creationist. And he said, Gould got kind of upset and said, look, this is my decision. You don't even know him. You don't even know me. Why were you calling me and telling me what to do with my student? This is my decision. And I feel resentful that you're trying to tell me what decisions I should make, especially relative to a student. So Kurt ended up with his PhD and uh, went on to other things. OK, uh, I can skip this. Court cases. Uh, there is, by the way, one case we won that I'm aware of. This was in uh, I think it's Minnesota, but it basically said, you as creationists cannot use our library to meet. And they went to court, and the judge said, you know, you really, there can't be a religious test on whether people can come into your library. Okay, Judge Lynn Alderman. A library, he said, cannot restrict speech about creationism in a public forum, which was the library. They got together and they talked about creationism in the library. So we won that one. And uh, that was, uh, I forget which case that was, but anyway. Another case, Moore versus uh, Gaston, Board of Education. Moore taught that Darwinism theory is true and Adam and Eve's story is false. He went on and said, there's no life after death, there's no heaven, there's no hell. And he brought out things like, you know, Christianity is the most highest church attendance is in the South. Crime rate's the highest in the South. So therefore, obviously, people go to church where Christians are more apt to be criminals. Okay, I'm not sure how many criminals you have in your church, but I don't know that we have any in mind. I don't know of anyone who was convicted of a crime. So he was teaching this to students. When one student had the audacity to record the lectures, and uh, went to court, and basically the court said, that's freedom of speech. You can say all the negative things you want to against Christianity. Well, maybe not everything, but what was said was allowed and uh, was upheld by the courts. So you can clearly teach against Christianity. You can teach religion. The problem is what you teach about it. You can teach negative things about it, but not positive things. And the court cases, by the way, in that area are uh, clear. Court ruled students have a right to hear all points of view except the positive point of view, which said, you can teach against Christianity, the Bible, etc., but not for it. And the courts have consistently ruled, though, that you cannot teach there's life after death, you cannot teach God created us, you cannot teach the problems with the evolution theory. And again, this is all called creationism in the back door. We, in essence, have state-enforced religion or anti-religion. And this parallels exactly with what happened in Nazi Germany. And I have a whole chapter on that in my book on, on Hitler. And uh, front page, Time Magazine, front cover, Evolution Wars. Uh, that is a good illustration of the fact that this is an issue which is being talked about. The press, though, is, I find, almost without exception negative. I probably had 100 interviews with the press about this issue, and all of them but two were negative. And I'll give you an example. They uh, called Wayne State University to determine whether I earned a PhD from Wayne State. Well, as you know, universities cannot give out information about students unless they have written permission. 
So university, as they do with everybody, said, well, we don't have anything on file which says we can give this information to you. So I'm sorry, we can't give this information to you. So it's a little blade in an article about me said, Bergman claims to have a PhD, and we contacted the university who, could not, who would not verify it. And I was the only one that they mentioned that. Now I wrote to him and said, I could give you proof that I do have a doctorate. And yeah, yeah, we know, but, but then could you publish a retraction? Because when people read this, what they get out of it is that I'm lying, I claim to have a doctorate, and I don't. That's what people read into that. And the, they wrote me a nice letter back and said, well, we really didn't say you didn't have it. We just said you claim to have a doctorate. And we wrote to the university, and they would not verify that, and that's all we put down. But it's kind of a, it's honest, I guess, but it's slanted. It's a lie, yeah, I guess it's. By the way, when I've spent a lot of time in courts and I find out uh, lawyers don't use the word lie, they use the word misspoke, which IE means lie. So you learn when you work with courts that they have their own uh, vernacular. Okay, uh, this is kind of a summary. Uh, uh, one interesting situation was where one instructor used articles from nature and science, and the school said he cannot use those articles. Because the reason he was using them was because, which was true, was because reading those articles would cause them to doubt Darwinism. So therefore, even though they're published in Nature and Science, etc., even though they're in peer-reviewed prestigious magazines, they were not, he was not to use these articles because the effect would be students would question the veracity of Darwinism. Can't do that. And so they were, wasn't allowed to do that. This person, by the way, eventually got fed up, and he's from Washington, this state, by the way, and he eventually ended up in uh, Korea, and uh, I ma emailed him several times, and I said, well, how are things going in Korea? And he said, I love it here. I can come into class, I can talk about Christianity, I can talk about creationism, and they all love it. No problems at all. Are you coming back to this country? Oh, when I retire, I might, but... I'm really enjoying teaching here in Korea. Koreans, by the way, love America, and there's a good reason why. You ever heard of North Korea? <laughs> Not a very good country to live. You ever been in South Korea? It's a world of difference between the two countries. And they realize that there's a world of difference because we helped the South Korea establish a good democracy, and they're doing really, really well. And North Korea, communists, that's what we would have been if North Korea would have won the war which they were very close to doing. So they're very, very appreciative of America and American things. Gonzalez, he got his doctorate at University of Washington here. And uh, his career at Iowa State University ended because of this film. I noticed a couple of you bought this. You watch it and you see whether or not this is a valid reason to terminate a professor. And that's DeHart. He's the one I was mentioning before. Roger DeHart. And I forget where he taught, but around Burlington, yeah. And again, excellent teacher. He taught this for like 12 years. And this is typically what happens. One student complains, goes to the ACLU, goes to the paper, and you get a deluge of comments that this man should be fired. Typically, it's one or two students that create a problem. And this reminds me in Nazi Germany when they evaluated what happened, they found out that a major problem for the Jews was people would complain and say, I think this woman next door is Jewish. And then they thought they were doing a good thing. And then the Gestapo would come by and arrest them. They ended up in the camp. The German government didn't have a list of names of everybody and what religion they were. Somebody had to report them. Somebody had to let the Gestapo know and in many cases, this is what happened. This is what happened to uh, Terry uh, Ten Boom. The, uh, somebody reported the Jews that they had in their apartment who was trying to get in and go to the Nazis, I guess. And labeling. Labeling is a big problem. Uh, we talked about earlier. Evolution science and creationism is religion. But if you think about it, we got a coin, we got two sides. 
how could one side be science and the other side of the same coin be religion? Can't. They're both science, both religion. And that science and religion is a label. It's a labeling. And uh, it, it's often distorts. So, as I mentioned, creationism is taught everywhere. The question is what is taught, not whether it is creation or evolution is taught. All of us are creationists. Everyone is a creationist. The only question is who is the creator or what is the creator? Atheists are creationists. Who is the creator? Mutations, natural selection, time, unforeseen occurrence, outworking of natural law. That is the creator. So we all believe there's a creator. The question is, who is the creator? And uh, I want to take time for questions. No one's done that. So, In conclusion, basically what we see in the schools are indoctrination. They're indoctrinated in one worldview. They only are aware of one side. And in talking to my colleagues, I can see this very clearly. Most of my colleagues in the, even the science department have no clue of the problems of Darwinism. They just are totally unaware. They just believe it's true, they teach it as true, but yet they're really not aware of the difficulties which have been brought out here and, I should mention, which are in the literature, the scientific literature as well. But how many read the literature and think about the problems which we brought out here? Evolution's rarely defined, in fact, hardly ever defined. And I'm happy to hear, hear that several people defined it. And again, from the goo to you by way of the zoo is probably one of the best definitions there is. Succinct, short. Problem has also been not the survival of the fittest, that's pretty obvious, but the arrival of the fittest, as I brought out earlier. And uh, there have been a lot of theories in the past which have been shown to be wrong. Gemules, pangenesis, orthogenesis, Lamarckianism, all of these theories have now been uh, disproved effectively. And uh, censorship hurts science. In the long run, let's assuming Christ doesn't return or, uh, or the, uh, Iran doesn't decide to drop some uh, atom bombs on us or other, other things, but let's assume we can go 100 years from now and finally the proof is overwhelming even to the scientific world that evolution is not true. They will then recognize that evolution got in the way of science. I believe evolution would be proven false, but it will be done by the scientists themselves. And that's, they're doing that now. In fact, over and over, articles come out in Nature or Science or some other journal, and they point out this problem, that problem, and so on. Evolutionists are going to prove evolution wrong. It just takes a while. As has often been said, theories change not by changing the adherence, but by the adherence dying off and new people taking over. And I see that that's what's going to happen. And in time, I think it's going to be obvious for scientists that evolution got in the way of doing science. So Darwin fundamentalists can deny Darwin doubters tenure, degrees, a place at the table, etc., but this doesn't change reality. Uh, they often say, well, it's a scientific consensus that indeed evolution is true and so on and so on. But it doesn't matter what the consensus is. What matters is the facts. Someone said we have... 28 scientists that proved Einstein wrong. And Einstein said, all it takes is one. <laughs> Why do you need 28? Just present the facts, prove me wrong. Just one scientist, that's it. I don't need 28. Consensus doesn't mean anything. It simply is a way of shutting out debate. Truth will prevail in the long run. It will take longer, uh, be, but it will be done mostly by uh, evolutionists. About 15 years ago, I published an article in the Journal of the American Scientific Affiliation, and I said basically that this junk DNA probably will mostly be found to be useful. Well, who proved right? Me or the evolutionist that said, nope, it's junk, it'll always be junk, it has no function, therefore that proves evolution. No God would create us with all this junk in our DNA. So they will disprove their own theory. What can we do? Uh, Louisiana and Tennessee now have bills passed which says you have a right as a teacher to critique Darwinism. That's what we need. Amen. You need a law which says as a teacher you cannot be fired for critiquing controversial issues like Darwinism and global warming and down the line. 
And that's what we need. Although those bills have been proposed and the ACLU and scientists have vehemently uh, condemned them. Evil is not caused by evil men, but by good men and women who do nothing. And that is all too often very, very true. It's the vast majority of us who don't do anything. And that's why evil exists. It's said in Nazi Germany, if 10% of the population were openly opposed to Hitler, there would have never been a World War II. Very small numbers, all it takes to change the world. Questions, comments? Anybody? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, that's better. Uh, I'm wondering, while the creationists cannot themselves change this situation, maybe that little buzz out there of the creationists uh, rearing their ugly head every now and then gets the attention of some of these scientists, and they think, well, maybe we should look into this a little bit more. That's a good point. Dwayne Gish mentioned to me when I first started speaking at colleges and universities, almost without exception, people were very positive. He said within the 20 or 30 years that he's been in this ministry, the mood has changed drastically. And I've noticed that. When I was at Bowling Green, ironically, there was far less antagonism towards creationism. Uh, in fact, we even developed a course at Bowling Green State University on creationism. And there was no opposition, none. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And the scientists, I think, are re overreacting by basically looking at our success, especially the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Boy, that sure sent a lot of people to the roof. And people mention that. They, several universities said there's no way we're going to hire anyone who's in, remotely sympathetic with creationism. Why? Because look at that Creation Museum in Kentucky. We, can't, we cannot allow that to happen. So I, I perceive, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I perceive that the antagonism has gone, gone worse and worse and worse. I saw a st statistic from creation science evangelism that they said they did a survey or referred to a survey that was done of scientists and they said that 55% were evolutionary, 45% actually believe Yeah, that's the general creation. public. That's the general public. Yeah, among, sci among eminent scientists, it's about 98 too. About 98 are evolutionists and atheists and 2% are theists and creationists in some way. Is there a higher percentage in the lower ranks? Uh, yeah, and there's a number of reasons why that's the case. The problem with the label scientist is, I have a friend of mine, she's got a PhD, she's a chemist, and she's trying to come up with a new way of coming up with uh, saturated fatty acids. You know, she spent seven years in the lab just mixing chemicals up trying to get a cheaper way of producing fatty acids for commercial reasons. Is she a scientist? There's a lot of scientists really are technicians. At the medical school, a lot of the stuff we did was technicians. We did a lot of evaluations which were very perfunctory, very, you do this, you do this, you do this. We would damage uh, brains of animals and then cut them open and see what part of the brain was destroyed. And that's pretty much routine. A lot of science is done by graduate students. In fact, most science is done by graduate students. And so are they scientists? So there's a problem with terms. Okay, someone else? Oh, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, because um, I took history of psychology class, and we talked about Darwinism, and I asked my professor if he was aware of the um, racist parts of Darwin and the original title of The Origin of Species, which I can't remember the exact terms of it, but I know it's very racist. and. Um, and he had said he had no idea, and he just went on like Darwin was a great guy. And I was wondering, because a lot of, especially in the secular academic world, there's a big emphasis on anti-racism and diversity, and I'm wondering, do these people know what kind of eugenics and racism this no, guy was? No, obviously they don't, even though it's been extremely well documented by so many sources. Uh, academic books, films, there's number of excellent films that uh, document this very, very well. It's said that Darwin's 1871 book, The Descent of Man, is racism from cover to cover. And it is. It's got a whole chapter on race. 
So uh, it's clearly enormously racist. And Darwin himself was. He thought that eventually the Negroes would become extinct and that would cause the division between the apes and whites to become greater. So the Negroes were in between and eventually he thought they, they're the weaker, the inferior races, they would become extinct and then be a greater gap between the two. We had a Ku Klux Klan rally, we have them in Ohio occasionally, and I missed it, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but I did stop by and pick up some of their literature. And boy, they just quoted evolutionary biologists page after page. In fact, I ended up with using a couple in my book on uh, Darwin. So they're very, very racist. They quoted all these scientists. Of course, they neglected to say that these scientists died 30 years ago, but that's... <laughs> They tried to make the, give the impression that science had proved clearly that African Americans are inferior race. And that's what they uh, used. Let, let me just add a few comments uh, to what Jerry had to say from my experience, because I've spoken on creation evolution in Eastern Europe, a bunch of countries over there, and I've had some interaction with uh, um, Chinese engineers in China. You know, I've traveled to China on business. And the reaction over in those two places is very, very different from it is here in America. In fact, in China, you know, it, I'm sure you've heard this before, the Chinese engineer uh, told us that in China, we can criticize evolution, but we can't criticize our government. In America, you can criticize your government, but you can't criticize evolution. A very interesting commentary. And in Eastern Europe, my experience is that they are very, very open to criticism of uh, evolution. Very different response you get over there than you do get here.